Well, we're here to answer your game, gaming and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. So we've been doing this podcast since 2018, uh, unbelievably, and over 199.5 episodes have gone by uh, with some special episodes tossed in there and some of the interviews we were talking about earlier. Now, the question I think we both get asked the most often, especially on social media, is what's your favorite game? Now, sometimes this comes in the form of what's your top five games right now? Other times it's more specific, like what's your favorite Star Trek game? A question we answered just last week. Now, other times it's people asking, have you ever done a top 100 games of all time list? And now and then people just want to know what we're playing right now. So kind of throwing those all together in the same pot, I figured the best way to answer the majority of them at once would be to do a top 25 games of all time list. We're not the Dice Tower. We're not going to do a top 100 and split it up into 10 different episodes. We're just going to spend one episode talking about our top 25. Now, the problem with this is my tastes change a lot, sometimes week to week, sometimes day to day. Um, And this is especially true based on game weights. Some weeks, and in general, I consider myself a heavier gamer. I like meatier, medium to heavyweight Euros, sometimes some really heavy, meaty stuff like Arkwright. But then on a week like this week, I just want to sit down and play some Racco. So that is what it probably affects my top list the most, or at least want to want to play right now. And also, we play a lot of games, yeah. many of which are new to us. Either games we've picked up, review copies that have come in, or now that they're happening again, games we've played at public play events. Mm -hmm. With trying new games so often, it's possible that we'll try a new game any given week that rockets up to be a top 25. So the while we're calling it a top 25 games of all time list, it's really a top 25 games of right now list. Now, I made one of these before because, as mentioned, I get asked this a lot especially when we first launched the show like that was the your new podcasters what games do you like which makes sense i think people want to be able to judge the kind of games i was into in order to determine how much weight things like our reviews and game recommendations would have for them so this is a pretty common thing how do you know you can trust a reviewer if you don't know the games they've played and what their personal tastes are exactly now something i'm going to do that i couldn't do last time is I made a top 25 list is to compare it to the old one. So this way we'll see what games are brand new on the list and any of the ones that are still on there have changed rank. And I've also got a list of the games that fell off my top 25. Now, also totally new this year, Sean's going to be on the images. We got to get him on the show answering questions too. So we're also going to get Sean here to give us his first ever top 25 games list. Right. First time doing this. Now that I feel I've played enough different games to actually warrant making a list that isn't just the 25 games I've played or something. Yes. Now, usually for these games lists, we present them in no particular order, but this time around, they are very much in order. Uh, We're going to start with number 25, um, working our way up to number one. I'll share my game and then Sean will share his. One thing that may be of interest to people is that we each created our lists in isolation using the Pub Meeple board game ranking engine. Mm-hmm. I have no idea what games are on Mo's list, though I have a pretty good idea, and he had no idea what was on my list. Lots of deck builders. That's what I expect, though I did see the list because we had to put it in the notes, and there's one that's not on there. I was shocked. Mm-hmm. Now, maybe once we're done, we'll actually check if we have any overlap and what games overlap. So. I think the games that overlap would be the tabletop bellhop best games you can purchase because we both like them. Now on to the list, starting with number 25. All right, for me, this is Through the Ages, a new story of civilization. On my last list, because I did, like we only talked about 25, this was number 35 on my old list. So this has moved up 10 points. Uh, This is a fantastic civ building game that is probably the best Civ building game out there, but a lot of people don't like the fact it doesn't have a map. So you're basically playing Civ 2 without a map. I love this game. This game's fantastic, but it is three to six hours long, and people can get frustrated by it because you have to play well or you can basically be eliminated. Now, personally, I feel that if you're going to play a game about civilization, if you choose to ignore military, 
getting screwed over in the last couple rounds of the game because you have no military by the people who do is just part of the game and not a flaw in design. But I have friends who think the game is broken because of that. I have had people rage quit this game after losing due to not keeping up their military. But it's civilization. Of course, you have to keep up your military. Well, That's the way I feel about it. I, I think arguably the the uh, what you could say is be, just because our civilization relies on military conquest doesn't mean that an abstract civilization must rely on military to win. What, so it, it, it shouldn't be that you require that the only path to victory requires military okay. is I think the argument. I, I'm not necessarily that's right, yeah. but I, I can see where that thought process comes through. Except this is very much based on our history with actual historic yeah, figures very, and actual very places. <laughs> like, this is not a, a raising new civilization. It does say a new story. And the thing is, you don't have to have the most military. You don't have to have the best. And you can go through the entire game without waging a single war. But if you build none, you're going to have a problem. Yeah. All right. Well, my number 25 is Horizons, a different kind of sort of civilization build. The 4X sci-fi uh, yes. game. Horizons. Now, what I need to know, is this Horizons with Extermination or without, or it doesn't matter? Uh, I would say without. I, I yeah, Horizon, The Extermination, I understand why it was needed. I understand that it adds a valuable X to the game and rounds it out into a full 4X game. Uh, but I wasn't in love with the game after it arrived. Fair. I personally prefer with it in. It does add, take that elements to the game and makes it less multiplayer solitaire. Although it wasn't really a multiplayer solitaire because you're also fighting over planets and taking stuff. Uh, this is a pseudo deck builder that I really enjoy from Daily Magic Games. So, yep. Number 24, Raiders of the North Sea. I don't know what it is about this particular X of the whatever game from Garfield, but I, I just adore this game. Uh, this was not on my old list because I did it back in 2018 and had never played Raiders of the North Sea. It is now my number 24. I love the put a Viking out or take one away. You get the action when you put out and you get when you take away. It's not or, sorry, and. You're putting one out and you're taking one away. And then the whole thing where you have to do some raids to get different levels of Vikings. My only problem with the game is that the dark gray Vikings look like the black Vikings. Other than that, to me, this is almost a perfect game. There's something about that game that just really suits me and the group I play with. It's also one of Deanna's favorite games. It's great two player. Um, we don't even own all the expansions yet. I did get the Hall of Heroes, which I like. Um, and does add to the game, but I don't even have all the expansion for it. Even just the base game is fantastic. All right. And my number 24 is DC Comics deck building game, the base DC <laughs> Comics deck building game, the original, the OG DC Comics deck building game, which is which is up there. That's the multiverse box up there. Oh, but yeah, okay. it's in there. It's 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 in that box. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, this one I'm not a huge fan of, but I totally get why you're into it. This one, when I first played it, it really bothered me that it didn't like you were playing Batman. You had the Batcave, but I now have the Lasso of Truth and I have it just felt weird. Yeah. It didn't feel like I was building a team. It felt like I was playing a character because I had a character card, but then I was using stuff from all over DC and that just bothered me as a purist. Yeah. No, and absolutely. The, the, the fact that you have a character yeah. does conflict with the rest of the game. Mm -hmm. um absolutely 100 percent uh, and and it's you, i can't even i can't even deny that, that <laughs> problem like, with yeah. the game it, it's true uh but the fact of the matter is as a deck building game the rest of it just works so well yeah. i'm willing to overlook that one kind of tricky thing you yeah. know maybe they're the leader of the team and uh, or yeah, something yeah, i'm sure i could yeah. probably justify it if i really wanted to but I'm, but I'm, no I'm, it's 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 a flaw in the concept it is that, that was my problem with it and to be honest the next time i played i think was with you or with tori Someone had brought over a version and we played and I'm like, no, this is better now that I know what I'm getting into and what to expect. Yeah, no, absolutely. Number 23 for me is Keyflower. Big drop here. Rank four down to rank 23. Oof. Still in my top 25. Main reason for that is I haven't played this game since 2018. I haven't even touched it. And it suffers from two problems. One, I built a box insert for it. That <laughs> dooms any game. Second, there are two expansions for it. One adds breadth, one adds depth. They're both awesome. But both make it more difficult to teach the game to someone who hasn't played before, and they're not easily removed. So it's one of those games where I'm like, oh, you got to try Keyflower, but then I got to sort through everything. I got to pull out the expansion. Then I got to teach it, and it's not an easy teach because it uses a very unique meeple-based auction where you don't know how many meeple people have, and they're bidding on things. 
And I, I love the game, but it's just not hitting my table. And I, there's a trivia question I could have thrown in. That just goes against the Bellhop's first rule. Fair enough. Uh, my number 23 is Azul. Uh, I think earlier uh, in the podcast, this would have been much higher, mm -hmm. but we have played a lot of games since then. Uh, it does still remain on there, though, especially thanks to the BGA implementation, which yeah. has given it a whole new life with us uh, because of the quick and easy way of playing yeah. without actually having to set up and deal with yummy little uh, tasty chiclet pieces. <laughs> And for me, this was, I think, like number two or three last year. I don't I don't have that list in front of me and completely dropped off the 20, top 25. I still like it, but we played it. It kind of has the Catan problem of we played so much of it for a while there. I got a little tired of it. And just there's so many other games I played since. Yeah, I find, you know, flip because we started flipping over to the other yeah, that side. Made a difference. That made a huge difference. Otherwise, even, without that, it might not have actually even made my top 25. Yeah, yeah, it's true. The, the blank side is kind of neat. What you have to try sometime you're over is I have the the crystal is it crystal mosaic the the expansion yeah that yeah. has two more boards yeah whatever that one's called twenty two plans of Caledonia wasn't on the list before because I hadn't played it yet I I don't even know how to describe this game it's a a market game a resource management game uh, area I don't even know what you're taking over parts of the map you're you're trying to make connected cities with some weird rules. Uh, there's fulfilling contracts. Uh, this game is just fantastic, and I don't know how to describe it. Like it, it's from Karma Games. Uh, Ajuma Jubu or something is the name of the designer. I'm sorry, I'm getting that messed up. Um, I, I just I was I'm smitten by this game. Now again, I made the mistake. I built a box insert for it, so it hasn't seen as much play as it should have. But I still love Clans of Caldonia, ranked at 22. And that designer is Juma Al Juju. See, I was close. I was close. Juma Al Juju. Uh, with art by Clemens Frones. <laughs> now, before we go on, just hi, I would love to hear in the chat. Have you played any of these? Let us know. Have you played this one? What do you think of each yeah. game on our list? Feel free to feel free to chat away while we're uh, going through this list. My number 22 is Anachrony, specifically the Infinity Box, but that's because oh. it's the only version I've played. <laughs> nah, but even then the infinity box just blows away the old yeah, one just yeah, it's, it's with with part organization the way you track different things it's it, it's worth it in many ways yeah no absolutely it's it's just a fantastic game all right my next one well, sorry we're on to 21 21 for me is cowboy bebop space serenade uh too new to be on the old list a deck builder that blew us away because we were expecting a possibly cowboy bebop themed tante coro or or Dominion, something light and, and tasted on theme, and instead got one of the best deck builders I've ever played. That it includes some neat board game mechanics, as well as a lot of moving people around and take that mechanics you don't usually see in a deck builder. Yeah, the, the use of all characters, no matter how many players are involved, uh, is just a really interesting uh, mechanism. So yes, yes, thumbs up to Cowboy Bebop, even though it didn't actually slip into my top 25. Yeah, that was this is the one that shocked me. I'm like, I know it was, it was on both of our best of 2022 games, the new to us games last year, yep. but I thought it'd be higher for Sean. I thought he enjoyed it more than some of these other games he's got higher up. Well, my number 21 is another tableau builder, deck builder, however you want to call it, deck mashup, uh, and that is Unfair. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the theme park management game with that is un, 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 surprisingly uh, unfair. And, and has take that aspect, despite it being a mechanic that I don't normally enjoy. Yeah. Uh, for some reason, Unfair topped out Funfair for me mm -hmm. uh, as, as the better game. Yeah, myself as well. Unfair was great. Then I played, or for you, Funfair. Funfair. We, we actually got them. Like, Unfair came out first, then they put out Funfair as kind of an intro. Well, I tried them in the opposite order, which I'm glad I did. Mm -hmm. I loved Funfair. Absolutely. Until I played Unfair. Yeah, Funfair is fantastic in that it's pared down. So especially yeah. if you've got younger players at the table or you mm -hmm. want a far more relaxing, easygoing game, Funfair is the game for you. But if you want something with a little more meat and you, and you aren't afraid of a little bit of take that, then Unfair really steps it up and, and sort of surpasses Funfair notably. All right, number 20 for me is Robo Rally. Uh, old rank seven. Robo Rally used to be my favorite game, and I still adore the original Avalon Hill 
lead miniature Richard Garfield, three different expansion boxes version of this game. I don't love the modern Hasbro version. It's good, but it's not great. They watered it down a little bit too much for me. And just because of that, pulling out my old game and dusting it off and getting people to play it is difficult. And the new one, I don't love as much. It's just not getting played as often. Thus, the big drop. Now, that said, Renegade Games has announced a brand new edition of Robo Rally. And I applied for a review copy yesterday. And even if I don't get accepted for that one, I might have to go pick up a copy because of how much I used to love Robo Rally. It's just, it's dropped. I just, I'm not playing it enough. Like, the, I can talk about, again, the Bellhop's first rule. I can talk about it as much as I want. But if I'm not playing the game, how good a game is it? Absolutely. Yeah. No. And for me, now, interestingly, another one that doesn't get played often, in fact, has only ever been played once. And my, number 20 for me is Weather Machine. And this is just because of the potential this game has. There How fantastic this game can be uh, if we can ever get it to the table a couple of times within a, the same month yes. to learn and remember all the ins and the outs of what is a very heavyweight game. Yeah. Uh, with a lot of moving parts and a lot of complexity uh, that really, I mean, I know I, to be fair, I backed this. I, I, yeah, I had some, some monetary. Yeah. There might be, there it. might be some buyer bias here, but I don't think there so. could be, but I mean, I bought it essentially for you. I didn't honestly yeah. think I was going to enjoy this game. It yeah. is a heavy, heavy game from a designer that you love with an artist. Well, an artist we all love. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Who doesn't but, love Ian O'Toole? <laughs> exactly. But uh, really, it was a game for you and D because it, it had that heavy weight. Yep. And then when I sat down to play it, I went, oh, my God, this is heavy. But the interactions are so fulfilling. There's so much mm -hmm. you get out of that weight that it really caught my eye. And that's Weather Machine. I'm still shocked that you enjoyed Weather Machine that much. I'm like, oh, now there's hope. Sean might enjoy <laughs> heavier games than he thought. He's on that part of the, the life cycle of the board gamer. Yeah. You can check our episode. He's on the, oh, oh, you know what? Actually, I don't mind heavy games. Next, we move to number 19, and that is Valeria Card Kingdom's old favorite. Um, I think there was some bias here because we've been playing other Valeria games, and I'm fondly thinking about the brand. I don't know if I was hating on the game last time in 2018 or what, but I had it ranked at 55, which just seems wrong, way too low. Maybe I was mad about something. But yeah, I have Valeria Card Kingdoms. We need to play it again. We need to get that out and get that to the table. We've been playing all the small box Valeria games. I've even played Quests and um, Villages of Valeria more often recently than I played Card Kingdoms. My problem is I'll still mess up the Dukes every time. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but we'll have to like show me your Duke and we'll explain it. Because yeah. really, yeah. are you going to play different <laughs> against someone else because their Duke's different? All right. So my number 19 is Emotep. Uh, just a great, solid, fun game that just, it, I mean, it just keeps coming back as a fun game to play. There's just no other way about it, around it. Honestly, that that's one of my favorite welcoming games now. The the base game with the A sides, we have the expansion, so we actually have, uh, what is it, 1,028 different possible board combinations, and no, we haven't tried them all. <laughs> it's just so great for getting people and blowing their minds like this is a board game. Like I, this, this is one we we need to get this one out to the barbershop bar actually because it's mm. been long enough. Yeah, but yeah, great. I I don't even know what you call it. It's like it's it's not draft. Like what is the main mechanic there? Mm. You're drafting cubes, but then picking worker placement spots. But then there's a reward for getting there first, and then you're picking what order you want to be on. Like I don't even know. So what, the what... Uh, our airy majority is okay well yeah for the scoring in most yeah but again that's only most of the spots Work, worker placement and area majority yeah. is what they claim okay yeah. so interesting I mean, there's set then collection there's the card drafting there's set collection in there's there as set well collection yeah so it, it, it does not classify itself well <laughs> put cubes on boats bring boats boats to uh monuments unload cubes get points that's 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 the mechanics yep <laughs> all right 18 concordia was 15 little bit of a drop again i think mainly because i haven't gotten to the table this is one i finally picked up salsa which is supposedly the must-have expansion and i read the rules for salsa but then i'm like man we haven't played concordia in so long and we played two games of concordia one week after each other and i was like yeah this game's good i like this game so much and then we're like now we got to play with salsa and it never happened i think that's when the rsv virus hit uh something i think it was last november it just ended up sick and it never got played so now i'm back at the point where if i play concordia again I'm not just going to toss in salsa. I'm going to want to play with the base game. 
and maybe I'll never get the salsa, but Concordia is still fantastic. To me, it's kind of like the quintessential Euro. Like you do all the Euro things. You're building routes, you're moving people along routes, you're collecting goods, you're buying and selling goods. It's like totally. So so Jeff Seuss is saying to toss in salsa too. Maybe I should just toss it in. Like, mm-hmm. I don't think it's that hard. What it adds is salsa is actually um, a word for salt. And salt is a wild card ingredient. You can use it for anything else. And and I think that what it's supposed to do is open it up so it, the, no one has an advantage by like, oh, you got all the silk spots. Now there's ways to pay for it. Right. There you go. It won't add a lot. This is with Jeff helping us out here. Yeah, I got to do it. Maybe we'll just have Jeff over <laughs> and we'll play Concordia and he can help us teach it. So my number 18, I think, has been influenced by our Discord because <laughs> uh, that's Castles of Mad King Ludwig, which I've only played a couple of times in one on one day. Yeah. But uh, people do keep po- posting pictures of it in our Discord when they get it played. Uh, and it is definitely a solid game. Although I have to say, I, I think I preferred it without all the expansion stuff. Or maybe that was just because we had issues with with setting it up and the setup of that. Yeah, we, we, was... the, I, I hate expansions. Where you can't just toss everything in. I hate them. That that has become a pet peeve of mine. And honestly, it's a reason Mad King Ludwig probably isn't on my top 25 list. As well as why Among the Stars isn't even considered on my list tonight. I hate these expansions or um, the Aztecs expansion for um, Imperial Settlers. Imperial Settlers, just like Concordia, I got an expansion for it, but hadn't played the base game in so long. Started playing it. Played three times in a row. Brenda loved it. He really enjoyed it. He's like, man, I don't think you ever showed me this game. We fell re- back in love with Imperial Settlers. So we grabbed the Aztec expansion, and instead of, boom, here you go. Just had you play the Aztecs, you take the Aztec deck. No, here's all these cards that you can put with your base game, but you got to swap them out for equal level cards. And then they turn it into a deck construction game, which requires prep ahead of time. And I just, I don't end up doing it. So... Yeah. Lidwig and less like having to pull out the expansions is annoying, but even more so the way you build the rooms is like X of the normal ones and X of the swan rooms and shuffle them. So then you got to sit there and at the start of the game, take all your tiles, separate out the swan one, shuffle the swan one, shuffle the not swan one, shuffle those together, put so many out, put the rest of the, like it's just a mess. Yeah, they made it into a great video game and a lousy board game in some ways. <laughs> And yes, uh, 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 CR and and yeah. Anchi games. I I wish we had the funds at that time. Yeah. If it had launched like in January, February, as we're getting checks from November <laughs> and Black Friday are coming in, that that, that probably would have got backed. And it, I hadn't even played it when that came out, so I wasn't. Uh, it wasn't. I mean, other than uh, oh, interesting because I know you guys love it. It wasn't really on my list at all. So, so yes, my number seventeen is Terraforming Mars. A uh, fantastic game that just, again, hasn't been played mainly because of the pandemic. It's a game I tend to bring out to public play events. And to be honest, oh, Deanna still likes it. But like Deanna, Kat, and Tori are all like, that's the group I played a lot with. Where are, I kind of saw a lot of Terraforming Mars. <laughs> so I, you know, and interestingly, I, I still have not played with, I think, the majority of the expansions. I've played with. A couple the, of them. The good one is Turmoil. As, yeah. as long as you play with Turmoil, because Turmoil like makes the game better, because it kind of k- kickstarts your startup and it gives you some direction at the beginning. Right. But uh, but yeah, no. I, there's a uh, most of the most of the expansions I haven't actually played with. Uh, so my number seventeen is another one that's I know a favorite of Mo's in at least historically, if not on his yes. top twenty five, and that is Eminent Domain. Uh, another yeah, fantastic uh, deck builder. Uh, another sci-fi game, Big Shock, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, Midweight, uh, a game where you're just, you know, surveying planets, trading resources, and building tech. Uh, you know, a, a really solid game from TMG. Now, I will say with this one, I think you need expansions, though. I don't even know if Sean ever played just the base yeah, game. I know we at yeah, least had not. the first expansion, which I think is a must-have. Um, it rebalances it so that using the, the red resource which generates fighters can actually work. Yes. You want to have that. Yeah. The big problem with this game, though, is this is a game that only works well once you start having some system mastery. And it's all based on the technology deck. Because this is a card game with a tech tree where when you build the technology, you literally get to grab this entire deck and pick your card. The AP for that can be terrible. Figuring out combos can be terrible. But as long as you play a bunch of games in a row... Eminent Domain's fantastic. Like, there was a bit there where we were working our way through the first three expansions, and we played a lot, and I was loving it at that time. Yeah. 
no solid uh, solid game that's eminent domain from tasty minstrel games so my number 16 is a huge jump previously 53 and that is zaya legends of a drift system and the reason for that jump they put out an expansion that fixed the marketplace that is all it took they put out an expansion where the value of goods changed based on their rarity and it's now valid to be able to just run a shipping route back and forth and it's now more valid to be a pirate or something else because the one player who happened to make the one route that was worth the most points can no longer just run that the entire game because every time they run it, it becomes worth less. Um, that is the something fallen star. I didn't even tape a note of embers of a fallen star. Embers. I think it's the name. Yeah, embers. Embers of a fallen star for Zaya made it awesome. So not the base game, but if uh, you forsaken get it, star, embers of a forsaken star. There we go. Embers of a forsaken star made Zaya better. It was already in my top 100 games. I love Zaya, but Zaya used to be like a, a silly romp I played where I laughed when I got 20s and got extra points into a, I am enjoying this game. I feel like I am someone, you're in space, you got to ship, do what you want, and I could do what I wanted. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, my number 16, as we shift in a hard uh, left-hand <laughs> turn away from a couple of science fiction games is Orléans. Um, again, this is one that I previously would have stayed away from it's that yep. ooh, it this is a this is a, it's weighty, a little meaty this is yeah. a weighty euro oh i don't know if this is really gonna and then i played it uh and oh, it's like no I, I really enjoy this game and i don't know why because nothing about this game screams out that i would like it it's not sci-fi it's not deck building mm -hmm. it's it's meatier and weightier than a lot of what i do uh the euros in general haven't really you know hooked me but for some reason, Orléans did, and mm -hmm. it just worked. Yeah, fantastic game. Yep. Next, number 15, I have a game everyone is jealous I own now because it is long out of print, and you're probably never going to be able to get it again, and that is Warhammer 40,000 Forbidden Stars. Sci-fi, 4X, Twilight Imperium kind of style game in space, but it's Warhammer with orcs the empire the eldar and all that fun stuff i this is a fantastic game that sean has got to play at some point it's on those sci-fi games sean needs playlist and we just haven't gotten to it they did a fantastic thing by having a board where it looks like everyone's adjacent to each other but there's moving warp storms that cut off areas that make it so you can't just keep attacking the same person it's mission based it's asymmetric and it's one of my favorite things programmed movement this is actually an update to the classic star uh craft board game with the way you program your moves in stacks of orders that you re then resolve top down so you see me put a counter out and then sean puts one on top and thinks my first thing is to move troops there and then he's going to move his troops to attack but it ends up my first thing was to set a trap that's how you play forbidden stars all right well the next one is one that i don't think anyone thought would be on anyone's lists <laughs> yes, uh, a year ago. Until, and yeah, even, well, not even a year. I mean, six, six, eight months ago. Yep. And that is Scythe. This is a game that we had bad experiences with. Everyone had bad experiences with it. Mm -hmm. uh, my first play of it was with the online Steam version that I picked up in a, in a humble bundle. And it was so obtuse. I didn't understand it. The tutorial made no sense. The game just fell flat for me completely yeah. and now having sat down and played scythe with some great friends and fun people <laughs> scythe is now number 15 on my top games list i'm not going to say anything else anymore right now because my number 14 would be scythe <laughs> for all the reasons sean just mentioned had a bad experience the first time i played it i'm now hooked absolutely adore this game behind me uh you can't quite see it but there are two side expansions waiting for me to open them up to make the game hopefully even better. I can't believe how, how I, how did I miss it? That first game? Like how, how did it go that badly that I didn't give it a chance and here huge, huge thanks to our fans who kept insisting. You got to try it. You got to try it. You got to try it. And thanks to Jamie Stegmeyer for eventually offering up a review copy and going fine. Our fans want us to try it. Let's give it a try and we'll find out. Yeah. Yeah. Scythe. I, I, we're eating crow on this one. Yeah. I, you know what? And this one just goes to prove that the teach and the group that you play a game with makes such a huge difference in the experience mm -hmm. of the same game. 
We can yes. go from a game that we have no interest in ever touching again to a game that we have love and are eagerly grabbing expansions for just because of who we were playing with. Yep. So I was Sean's 15 and my 14 side. Now my 14 is Dominion. Uh, an old, a classic, but again, it's it's that, you know, gotta love the deck builders. Yeah. And Sean hadn't played this one and actually came over. He was playing all these modern deck builders. I'm like, <laughs> you know what? Let's sit back and let's go to the grandfather, right? Uh, to be fair, it wasn't the first deck builder, but it was the first modern deck builder where there's a market to buy from and all the stuff that we're now used to seeing in every deck. Yep. Uh, Dominion, people love. I admit, I'm still not a huge fan. To me, it's just, it's, it's, I hate the fact it's not a variable market. What I don't like about Dominion is that it's a puzzle. You sit down, you figure the puzzle out of the cards, and whoever figures that puzzle out wins. I much prefer the randomness of, oh, there's a cool ship and building combos as I go, as opposed to trying to figure out the puzzle. Now, maybe it's because I have played with some Dominion Sharks <laughs> and it's Sean's complaint about Catan is, is most of the games of Dominion I played with are people who own every set for Dominion, have played a million and a half games and just destroy me when I play. So that could be some of the reason. But generally, I like a little bit more out of my deck builders than Dominion. Fair enough. Next, my number 13, Tyrants of the Underdark. And I'm not sure why this wasn't ranked before. I, maybe I didn't get it until 2018. I think, I, think you, I think this one popped up later on your list. Yeah, on, on so, list. so I know I got a review copy at Origins. and Maybe I got it at Origins 2018. This, to me, was the first combination deck builder board game. Everyone likes to talk about Arnak and Dune. This did it way before that. This is an area majority war game with dudes on a map, folk on a map, sorry, folk on a map, and deck building combined, where one of your resources is for controlling the board and the other resources for improving your deck. It's drow themed and does some fantastic stuff to tie in that theme with assassinations and spies and a promotion system that I think is utterly brilliant as a way to both score points and to thin your deck. Now, this one just did get reprinted at a lower price point, with both expansions, like, or sorry, all the expansion decks, the one expansion came with multiple decks, all in the box now, but way less plastic. And I don't know how I feel about that, but I'm glad I have my original copy. And I, frankly, Tyrants of the Underdark, I think it's got a lot of potential. It doesn't make my list primarily because it benefits from system mastery. And yeah. when I played it with Mo and D, they had been playing it constantly for mm. quite some time. Uh, and sitting down with experts in the game or not expert, well, well, well-rounded players in the game as a new player puts yeah. you at a significant disadvantage in that game. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that, that did color my opinion of the game. I have to say. Totally fair. Uh, my so what's number, your 13, my number 13, jumping right back into a theme and back to something you've already covered. And that's Zaya legends of Adrift. Again, you've got to have the embers of a forsaken star. Yeah. Fantastic. Game. Sticking with sci-fi games, our number 12s both fall into that category. Mine is Alien Frontiers. This one actually dropped. I had this at 9. It dropped to 12. John has finally tried it, but hasn't played it nearly enough to have the mastery that we do. But what a great... It, the, to me, this was the definitive dice placement game, where your workers are dice, you roll the dice, and then you use the outcomes on the dice to decide what to do. I don't think anyone done it, did it before. It's also one of the first ever big board game Kickstarter successes that then went on to, I think, six different editions, each improving the components. Big props to my friend Jamie Shepard, uh, Will Chamberlain in the chat, if he happens to be on tonight. He backed the original Kickstarter, then backed another one for an upgrade kit and got me hooked on this game. This, to me, is the perfect one hour to an hour and a half sci-fi game. All right, and my next one is, again, sci-fi all over again, Eclipse, Deccan Dawn for the Galaxy. Uh, a little bit longer than uh, Alien Frontier. Uh, yes. <laughs> and this is the re-implementation of Eclipse, of course. Which Sean never played the original Eclipse, but they are very similar. It's just better Eclipse. Yep. And again, we have the Kickstarter, so there's the added bonus of awesome inserts and the uh, I don't know if I still, I, I'm still on the fence about the new player boards for tracking your resources compared to the old, but they did improve a bunch of other things, including adding all the expansions. Fantastic sci-fi game. Um, to me, this one's better than um, most other big 4X games. 
Yeah. Uh, and some really great iconology in there. Uh, I, uh, in there. Um, yeah, they've, they've really done some great, some great things with this game. And again, it's sci-fi. So, yeah. And from the chat room, I'm going to have to quote Ryan here because he's right on. Does Second Dawn eclipse the original? Yes, it does. <laughs> Next up is our number 11s, starting with mine, which is Brass Birmingham. Uh, this was not on my list because Birmingham is the new version of Blacks. There were two versions. We paid to kickstart these because I loved Brass so much. Brass was at one time the ugliest game in my collection. It is a fantastic Martin Wallace train game, route building game, resource management game. Absolutely adored it. And it was ugly as sin. I have to thank Roxley Games for giving it a nice visual update. But at the same time, they also worked with a new designer who worked with Wallace to put out Birmingham which is brass with beer is what a lot of people like to call it. It is a slightly twisted version of brass with a new resource in it, opening up more options. Uh, the new production's fantastic. I will admit I'm slightly biased because I backed the Kickstarter and I have the awesome iron clays that went with it, but I adore the original brass. This was a neat update to the original. And uh, pointing out in the, in the chat room that the new BGG top game brass, uh, but is we it? liked it. We liked it before it became BGG. Top. But that is not Birmingham. That is not the game we're talking about right now. Your number 11. My number 11 is The Crew Quest for Planet Nine. Just a solid game. And I mean, we everyone in the, who's watched this show ever, even once before, knows we are a fan of Trick Takers. And The yes. Crew just did a fantastic job of having a trick taker uh we've still never gotten through it i i think 28 or 30 or something like that 30 is, something yeah we're in there. High i remember got. 30 gave us a real hard time i do remember yeah. that but uh hopefully we can get that back to the table again sometime uh but yeah the crew quest for planet nine is just a solid look at trick takers down to the top 10 for me, my number 10 game is Russian Railroads. This one actually moved up quite a bit. It was my rank 27. Um, the only problem with this game is that I did not have the money to back Ultimate Railroads, which included German Railroads as well as a new expansion, including Canadian Railroads. Now, based on all those railroad names, um, including the stupidest name expansion ever, Russian Railroads colon German Railroads, um, this is not actually a route building game. You are buying and laying track. You are, it's an economic game about building stops and improving your track levels and improving your trains. This is to me the ultimate engine building game. And yes, I get the pun. This is a game where in round one, you're going to be happy to score seven points. And in the final round of the game, you're going to spend five minutes adding everything up to realize you made 380 points. And then the game stops before you get to run that engine one more time. And it's just like the perfect time. I love the this series of games, Russian Railroads, and then German Railroads just improved it by providing new boards. I this is a game. This is because Sean enjoyed Weather Machine. I want him to try this one now. And and when you tell me it's not a route builder, I I become yeah. interested, infinitely more interested. Yes, it is uh, not a route builder. <laughs> no route building at all. Uh, my number ten takes a sharp left turn from Russian Railroads into. The evil that is Forever Evil, the DC Comics deck building expansion. Forever Evil added uh, a bunch of new mechanics and tokens and things that happen in the game to really sort of broaden out the experience of what DC Comics deck building offered. Mm -hmm. uh, it was no longer just a really simple, basic, uh, almost Dominion level, except for the multi you know the variable yeah. marketplace where you're just worrying about attack and buy uh you got a whole lot more flexibility and uh resources to manage when you got forever evil now this doesn't happen often this isn't one i played <laughs> i have not tried this game at all number nine wallenstein thank you neil for getting me to play this game with your german copy with photocopied, <laughs> printed out at work, English rules taped onto the cards and got me hooked on Cube Tower games. I love this Dirk Hen war game. This Wallenstein, there's another version of it called Shogun, which we may talk about later. Um, Wallenstein is more cutthroat. The map of Germany, everything's connected. It's easy to get anywhere. You're 
fighting with the cube tower. You're programming your movement because you have a card for every province. You decide what happens in every province. But it's not as much of a war game as you'd think. You can only ever make two attacks per turn and you don't play a lot of turns. Plus, the actual victory points are for building buildings. And this shows how often I play Wallenstein and Shogun. I can't remember what the buildings are in Wallenstein. I remember what they are in, in Shogun, but there are three levels of building, like palaces, theaters, and churches or something. You're actually getting points for controlling territories that have those in them. So you don't necessarily win by winning the most wars, which I think is brilliant. And that cube tower, the way reinforcements work, the way you have to tax your people, the way the farmers can revolt, I adore Wallenstein. I have to say the cube tower games have not won me over the way nope. the, uh, the way they have with Mo. My number nine is one that I've still never actually played with Mo, uh, <laughs> but this is Suburbia. This is one D actually introduced me to at uh, must have been Breakout uh, Queen City. I was think it Queen it was. City? I think it was the one Queen City. No, I think to. it was actually Breakout. Was it Breakout? I think okay. it, I think you were you were role playing at Breakout, and uh, okay. D and I went into the game and and taught me suburbia uh and i since went on and grabbed the app which is uh, a fun implementation yeah, of it and uh have played a ton of suburbia um yeah and he's saying yes it was breakout okay uh so yeah suburbia is a fantastic game that does not get to the table anywhere near often enough i promise suburbia is another uh fomo uh not even fomo what's fomo after the fact where you <laughs> did miss out um, the, the, they had an awesome Kickstarter for a deluxe edition with this tower and stuff. And I'm like, I didn't get the deluxe edition. Every time I see people sharing pictures, it looks better. Uh, so see, I, that's why I, I know, that it's such, I mean, the game doesn't need fancy components. Yeah, it's I so I also built a box insert. So, oh, uh, well, there you go. <laughs> that's, that's the other problem. <laughs> All right. This, I, I just noticed our number eights and this is hilarious. It is be, because these get compared a lot. That is funny. I, I had not, again, I hadn't seen Sean's list. It's been in here. Like on on our, our our you know shared file we use, but I hadn't gotten to see this. Uh, my number eight is Lost Ruins of Arnak. Uh, not on the list because it didn't exist in 2018. Um, Tyrants of the Underdark might have been the first deck builder with a board, but man, does Lost Ruins of Arnak do it well? Especially once you realize it's not really much of a deck builder. You are not cycling through your deck like you would in a normal deck builder. It's more of a like deck improvement game than a deck builder. You're, you're not going to get through that deck multiple times. I there is the, What I love about this game, once you've learned to play, is the squeeze out one more move. The looking at my two people, my two meeple, looking at where I can place them going, it looks like I only get two actions this turn. Oh, but wait, if I move this meeple here, I can then get this thing that lets me tap this guy. They'll give me two more resources, which then I can use to buy this card from the market, which lets me return that meeple so that I can send them to this new spot, which will give me a temple token, which I can then put on my board to send out my second meeple over here. And then when he's there, I can't afford to defeat the monster that's there, but because I have this temple, I can turn it into extra arrows. Then with the leftover arrow, I'm going to move up on this track, which gives me another coin, which also lets me move up on this track. I love that puzzle and the feeling of pulling off a longer than you thought you were going to get turned. That that I stretched out one more thing. That is what I love about Arnak. Uh, and for my number eight, I went with Dune Imperium. <laughs> Which, uh, the reason this is funny, if people don't know it, is those two games came out around the same time. They both use deck building. They use a board. And everyone compares them. And everyone likes one more than the other. And I think everyone's wrong. I don't think they are <laughs> comparable at all. Uh, I think they are both solid, good games in their own realms. But to think that they are the same or similar, no. I, I don't I don't get it all. Even having played them both on the same day. Yes. I don't I don't see see it. Uh, but yep. I am a sci fi fan. I am a long time Dune fan. And I think Dune Imperium did it well. I can't wait to see how the expansions bring even more to the table. Another one announced yesterday. Oh, they really? are pumping them out ridiculously. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's immortality, I think, or immatorium, something. It was just announced yesterday. Ooh. I I dug Dune Imperium, but Dune Imperium is a deck builder. You're going to go through your deck multiple times. Everyone starts with the same starter deck. You're going to shuffle a bunch of times. You're going to buy cards that bring things out of your deck. And yes, there's worker placement elements as well, and it's well done. It's very different from Arnak. Arnak, the cards in your hand are resources. They're not really a deck or an engine. 
uh, Immortality, the Benny Benny Flylax uh, expansion. Expansion. There you go. On to number seven would be the other version of Brass, which is Brass Rank Lancashire, which was the original Brass. Like the original wasn't called Lancashire, so I don't know why they called the new one Lancashire. But this is the original Brass reprinted Broxley Games. Put it this way: the the graphic update and one simple rule change moved this from forty two to seven. That's how much of an improvement it made. Now, the rule changes at any time, you can discard any two cards to use as any other card. That was not in the original game, and you could get stuck with a bad hand, or you could get cut off on the board, so there was nowhere to move but to one city. And if you didn't have that city's card, you were screwed. Well, now you can discard two cards, you can get there. Completely fixed the only problem I ever had with Brass, except for how it looks, and this new version looks beautiful. So, to to be fair... Uh, according to Board Game Geek, Brass, Brass Deluxe, and Brass Lancashire are all the same game. Yes. But Brass. But like I said, it's Birmingham such a minor change. Is Birmingham is a different game. Yeah. And yeah Birmingham, there's different Birmingham, resource. Yeah. Birmingham is the one that's number one. Oh, Birmingham is number yeah, one. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I thought Lancashire was number one. No, it's Birmingham. There you go. All right. And my number, uh, where are we here? Oh, seven. Right. Yeah, we are on number seven. seven. My number seven is one we have talked about and people have complained about us talking about, but there may be goodness on the future. That is the Aventuria adventure card game as a whole, uh, rather yes. than any specific modules, because just the whole Very system uh, is, has been fantastic to enjoy. And I can't wait until everyone's vision is back up to snuff yes. and uh, health is good so that we can get back in to more aventuria adventure card game so what i'm going to do now uh you are welcome ulysses spiel is shout out their currently live ends in six days kickstarter i just dropped a link in the show notes and the reason this i think is important is that they fixed everything we complained about like we love aventuria we adore aventuria don't play the dual mode the dual modes whatever There, there are much better dueling card games out there I'm sure people know many of them. Totally ignore that fact. The the play the story is so dang good. And I don't know what my computer is doing right now. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it is so good. But what they did is they have now kickstarted a new two expansions that finally add the story that was missing. So what they have done now is you now have branching paths. You now have character levels. So when you get XP at the end, you don't just bump up one skill by one point to make your die rolls one easier. They now have talents that are asymmetric and unique to each characters. There's like something like 800 and something new cards in this thing. And the other thing they've done is they've rewritten all of the existing adventures with this new version. This new, what do they call it? They call it something. I'm trying to find the name of it. Path of Legends. Using the new Path of Legends. And like right, the box started off at 600 cards, but with stretch cools, there's proficiency staffs now for all 15 heroes that exist. That's 22 new cards for each of the heroes that already exist. Plus with stretch goals, 84 more um, new extra cards that are specific for leveling up and they're better versions of your weapons and skills. Literally everything I complained about in Aventuria seems to have been addressed with these expansions. So yeah, go check that out. Um, we should have reviewed this, but we got hit by COVID. Like that's, that's all I can say. So big shout out for that one. The Adventure Adventure Card Game Stories and Legends. If anyone's listening to this, there are six days left, which means if you are listening to this episode when it drops, you should still be able to back. What I'm trying to find out from them is if they're going to have a late pledge or a pre-order. It is funded. This is going to happen. Uh, we're just hoping that all the stretch goals can unlock. All right. That was seven. Now we move to number six. And I get, uh, I don't know if it's the first overlap on the list with Sean, but this is where I have Orleans. It has actually moved up from rank 10 to six. And that to me is because of the trade and intrigue expansion. Trade and intrigue offers, I think it was four different modules you can add to the game. One, you leave in the box. Don't bother with intrigue. I don't think Orleans needs to take that. And I don't like the new intrigue board compared to the other new board that comes in this because there's already a replacement king's court board uh it just added more to the game i love including more buildings you can buy and everything else orleans fantastic this is one of the games that at some point i may actually spend the money to geek up the bits 
So instead of wooden tokens, there'll be little plastic ones like we did for Quacks of Quedlinburg. It's one of the games I enjoy enough that I don't mind spending the cost of the game again to make it more tactile and enjoyable. Yeah, this one fantastic as I already uh, as I already pointed out. Uh, and uh, the one nice thing about trade and intrigue is if you are a person or have a group that does love to mm-hmm. take that stuff and really wants, it gives you that option. But yes. you don't need to put it in if you've bought yeah. the expansion if your game if your group doesn't enjoy that. So my number six is Core Worlds. And I haven't admittedly gotten to explore this as much as I would like. I know it is a huge, uh, you know, it's a love of Moe's. And I'm sure it's not on his list because he hasn't played it in ages and ages and ages. That's exactly Uh, why. But but the plays I have gotten of it really wet my whistle and intrigued me in getting more Core Worlds to the table. Yeah, for years, Core Worlds was my favorite deck builder. Uh, like easily my favorite deck builder but it's long it's it's it takes a long time to get through it's it's a bit of a slog it's an engine builder you got to go through eight different levels before you get there and then final scoring is kind of weird with all the core worlds and if you're not playing with experienced players that sometimes becomes a mess uh it was up there but that one has dropped and again a big part is i haven't played it recently my number five we just talked a whole bunch about go back to kickstarter adventure adventure card game wasn't on my list because I hadn't played this in 2018. I adore this. Um, I, I I am so happy we got this game. This was something that someone reached out to me. Eric Simon got a hold of me and was like, hey, we think you'll love this game. We just want you to talk about it. No obligation. You don't have to even review it. But I think you'll love this game. And Eric, I know through uh, some some shared friends and I played with him at cons and stuff. So he sent this over this massive box of stuff we still haven't even gotten through. And I'm like, ooh, I hope I like this game. And then we played the duel, and I was like, oh, well, this game. <laughs> and then we played the adventure co-op mode. And I, except for the fact it's a little dark and a little problematic at times in its content, the gameplay, though, is fantastic. Absolutely. My number five is uh, was introduced to me by Mo, but my pleas have actually all been with my kids and that is Clank, a deck building adventure. Uh, this was, you know, one of the big introductions of my kids into my love of deck building that both of them really got into. My son did enjoy DC. Uh, my daughter played it some, but didn't love it. Whereas they both really enjoy playing Clank. Yeah, this one, I, I don't know. It's it's up there for me. I, I could look at my top, whatever I ended up, top 500 list or whatever this <laughs> thing generated. It's in there somewhere um probably in the top 100 but i haven't been playing this one as much i i feel like i need to do is get some expansions to refresh it i need to get like the monkey temple or something what i would love to do and i i'm kicking myself for not doing it when it was readily available is not picking up the legacy version at the time we were playing gloomhaven and then we were looking at jaws and then it was the pandemic and it's now out of print and i've heard really good things about it so i'm kicking myself for not picking up clank legacy Number four, a game people predicted might have been my number one last year. It was actually my number eight last year is the Duke. Um, I I still play it. I, I still bring this out. We had it out at chapter two. Deanna and I still play the Duke. We bring it with us on vacation. One of the best two player board games I've ever played. Chess based, except for the fact the pieces show how they move. And when you move them, how they move will change. Uh, this is this to me is a modern classic. Like, why is there not more Duke coming out? And not Yarl. Yarl, no, is not in my top. It's not even in my top 100. Because they just, they made it too strategic. I like that little bit of randomness. That that little bit of, I pull from the bag. And the fact my Dukes can move all the way across the board in one move. All right, well, my number four is, uh, I swear the last of these, I really, I swear. <laughs> uh, but DC deck building, the Teen Titans. Now, I, I'm not even sure if I can explain why uh, it's been a while since I've had it at the table, but there was just something about the play of Teen Titans and the interactions of the cards that made it feel tighter and fresher. Uh, and, and maybe it was because it was a little more narrow than DC, uh, yeah. you know, having that Teen Titans uh, narrow focus but it really made for a fantastic game. And I think if I were to play, if I were to suggest anyone who was interested in DC deck building, go out and buy the Teen Titans pack first and foremost. 
and and use that as your decision whether or not you want to dive in as headfirst as I have. Now, it could also just be time, right? This one came out significantly after the original, so they would have got feedback from everyone playing online too. Yeah. All right, this is the only game that stayed exactly the same for me, which was pretty funny. Uh, that is Shogun. Uh, this is the Japanese retheme of Wallenstein. And times in my life, Wallenstein was ranked higher because I liked how cutthroat it is. But now I preferred the laid back, yes, you can turtle. So you can fail at turtling as well, version of Shogun. Again, Cube Tower, you're, uh, I already basically described it. For every province, you get a card and you pick one of eight things to do in each of your provinces. It's even got some thematic stuff there, like this province is going to war, while this province is going to build a granary, and this province is going to raise taxes for you. I, I don't know. I love this game. I always have. Like, ever since playing Wallenstein with Neil, I don't even know how many years ago in German, I've been obsessed. Now, there is one game, and here's where I messed up with Sean, <laughs> is I introduced the series to him with Immortals. Immortals does not belong on this list. Immortals doesn't belong anywhere near this list. Put it this way, I started this list by ranking my games on Board Game Geek and only looking at the ones I ranked seven or more. Immortals wasn't in that list to even make this list. So, yes, I love these Cube Tower games, but get Shogun or get Wallenstein, ignore Immortals. Fair enough. My number three, Space Base. One we've talked about more than enough, I think, on this show already. Yes. Uh, for you guys to know our feelings about this great game at so many player counts. That's one of the really yes. amazing things about it is yes. how many player counts it works just as well at. And I will note, uh, AEG maybe sponsor our giveaway later today, which I probably could have hinted at some other games earlier. <laughs> Adventure. Yeah. yeah. Space space is fantastic. Didn't make my top 25. I don't even know why. Like I said, we use board game ranking engine. When I sit and think about it, I feel it should be in my top 25, but it didn't come up. I don't know what I ranked higher. All right, my number two game of all time, and this actually I feel comfortable even saying of all time, is Eclipse, Second Dawn for the Galaxy, old rank 28 or 38. The reason it was ranked 38 is I didn't have any expansions. I didn't have specifically the Ancients expansion that actually puts different Ancients on the different planets and little ships there, or the one that gives asymmetric ships. I know it's just a physical upgrade, but the fact our forces look different makes the game better. And then there's the improvements with Second Dawn, the refigured tech deck, um, missiles that are no longer broken. They fixed the rules for missiles compared to the old edition. You no longer win by just putting as many orange dice as possible on your ships, at least in battle. Uh, and the upgrades, like just even the M whatever MDSC, I can't remember what it's called. The thing in the center of the board is one of the coolest miniatures I own. Throwing that out, I just Second Dawn took a game I love and just made it better. There we go. My number two is the duke uh and again this one comes back to family me and my son sitting down playing the duke before school after school on the weekends it's just a great game yep. that really fits with a whole lot of different people and play styles uh you can't go wrong with the duke folks all right number one this took longer than i thought it would we're talking <laughs> more than i thought number one for me is anachrony the infinity box version again it jumped up 10 ranks mainly because of the new edition plus i've now actually explored some of the expansion content though still not all of it which is ridiculous that i haven't done this i there's just that game is so good like like the waking up your people the having to put them in mech suits the getting resources from the future and having to pay them back the various asymmetric factions the fact that i have a book this thick that just lore on this post-apocalyptic world, I, I, Anachrony, just the, every time I play it, I'm like, I need to play more of this. Every time I play it, I swear it goes up. Well, now <laughs> it's at the top, so it can't go any further. Fair enough. And my number one is one that hasn't been played enough. Uh, I want to get it to the table more, although I fear if I do, it might actually get replaced by some of the other fantastic sci-fi games out there. Yeah. And that's Pulsar 2849. Uh, this one was such a, a great introduction to meaty meteor heavyweight yeah. sci-fi games uh and it hooked me because of that um and there's probably a little bit of that bias that's gotten this hey. into number one but it is where it is hey if your first experience playing games fantastic it totally deserves it. yeah all right i'm gonna quickly go through this because again this took longer than i thought just these are the games that dropped off my list 
and where they ended up and why I think so. Number one is Azul from two to 96. That's a huge drop. But anymore, like Azul is still a great welcoming game. I still want to bring it to events. I still want to teach new people. I have very little interest in sitting down and playing Azul. But to me, that Azul is my new splendor. I played so much of it, so many games. I have no interest in just sitting down and playing Azul. Obviously, Sean still really digs it. The biggest drop, Race for the Galaxy, probably because I have played over 150 games on Board Game Arena. I used to adore Race for the Galaxy. I still like it, but now I just feel like I've seen the game played out. I've seen every possible card combination. I've, I've done it all in that game, it feels like. And I'm actually kind of glad eventually I didn't get invited to another game of Race for the Galaxy. That dropped from 5 to 45. Plank, a deck building adventure. 6 to 64, way bigger drop than I thought. But you know what? When I'm sitting there going, I want to play a deck builder, it just it's not even on my list. Like, I don't even think, oh, let's grab Clank. Again, I think part of it is I have played my copy a lot, and all I have is the, the first expansion with the, the water. I can't even remember what's called the underwater expansion. I think for me, Clank just needs a refresh. I just need something to make it new and interesting again. Bruges, 12 to 55. Just shows what I was playing at the time period. Um, I dig Bruges, but Bruges is not easy to teach, and we just haven't been playing it because I don't like teaching it. This is one of those ones that could easily bump back up if, hey, excuse me, if say I bring it out to the barbershop bar and we play, and people like bring out Bruges again, and I play it a few more times in a row. Onitama, the biggest drop, thirteen to one seventy nine. It was neat. It's cool what it does. I just rather play the Duke. Like it, it's 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 a two player only game. If I'm going to grab a two player game that I'm going to throw in the glove box and bring with us on vacation or down to the beach, it's going to be the Duke over Onitama. Agizia, for years, my biggest hidden gem, the game everyone who came over is like, oh, what's something interesting? I played Agizia with them. Was 14, now down to 68. The charm finally wore off, and I think it just got dated. It's, it's an old school Euro with a worker placement to choose what actions you're going to take, set collection, card collection tableau building spending resources to build monuments it just it feels like an older game it's got the Catan problem it just feels a little dated next i have hamster roll drop from 16 to 44 it's still good but i think mainly it was just the fact of i you know what it's a dexterity game it's fun it's a really good dexterity game but going through the list every time it came compared to a game i was like i'd rather play a game than play this silly ham uh, Pitch Car also dropped uh, from 17 to 28, so it's this close to being on my top 25. Pitch Car is just so much fun for big groups, and I love having have tons of the tracks setting them up. Uh, Concept, the another huge drop, 18 to 107. I, I The joy of this game is just slowly slipping, I think mainly because I haven't been in situations I want to play it, possibly because we haven't done an Extra Life All Night Gaming event in three years. That could be why. Uh, Power Grid. The first time ever I did a board game ranking list, it was a number my number one. Um, particularly the deluxe edition from 19 to 36. I still dig it, but it's not getting plays. On to Teutonica, there was a point there I was playing it like crazy. Uh quite a bit. Sorry, bonkers playing it bonkers. Uh 20 to 80. Big drop just because I'm not playing it. And again, that's one that I bet you if I start playing it and I redid this list next year, it would bump back up. Zongwo. 21 to 111 as it ends up. I was playing extreme for most of the games I played. Opaque game, not easy to teach and hard to get to the table. You need your heavy gamers to play this one. Gloomhaven, I think this is a sign of the times. In 2018, we were live streaming it. Now we haven't played it since COVID. From 22 to 50. And I will say some of the brilliance has worn off on that game, especially once it went from being extremely difficult to extremely easy. Food Chain Magnet, 24 to 49. Again, big meaty games that aren't getting played, which also fits for Dungeon Lords Happy Anniversary Edition 25 to 37. Some of our overlaps uh, for those who want, who want to keep track, The Duke, Orléans, Aventuria, Anachrony, Eclipse, Dawn of the Second Galaxy, Scythe, and Zaya were all overlaps on our list. Which is actually not much for the fact that almost every game you played when you played with me. Absolutely, yep. But there you have, folks, our top 25 games of right now. So I was shocked by how many on my list changed in the last three years and 200 episodes. I'm really looking forward to doing this again. Maybe we'll make it an every 100 episodes thing. Maybe we'll do it again for episode 300. 
and see if Sean's list changes as much as I did. Yeah, I'm very interested to see what my what happens to mine over time now that I have that baseline uh, original set to work with. Now, remember, we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions. Consider us a dear Abby for tabletop gamers. Get your questions to us by clicking on Ask the Bellhop at tabletopbellhop.com, emailing questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or hitting me up on social media where I can be found everywhere as tabletopbellhop, one word. 